Okay, let's get started. So, uh, announcements. First of all, exams. Lots of exam info here. This is on announcements. So, mastery exam, if you still have a zero, you need to get into any office hours and pass. You need to, this is it. Four days left. To get into any office hours, got to pass the mastery. Exam three is this Thursday night. Okay, can I have everyone's attention, please? Don't talk, stop talking, please. Stop talking. Okay, so exam three is Thursday night. Same procedure, same place. Arrive between 6.15 and 7.30 in the basement at Wexler 21. That's also formerly known as PSA. Um, that's Thursday night. So let's start, we'll talk about studying for a second. The final <laughs> exam is a week from tonight. 7 p.m. in Neeb. Where is Neeb? Anyone know where Neeb is? By Coor. Okay, so somewhere close to Coor. 7 p.m. Room 105. That's a week from tonight. So when you're studying for exam three, you want to just have in mind that you're studying for the final two. Okay, so that's a good thing. It's a nice thing about having a late final third exam is there's not a bunch of material in between. Although this week's material is not on exam three. So what we, what we start today will not be on exam three, but it's very important for the final. So this week's material, crucial for the final. Let's talk about studying for the exam. So if you haven't yet, hopefully you have, but if not, we're going to homework Solutions and exam prep. <coughs> exam three and related quizzes. Okay, can I have everyone's attention? <clears throat> so you got the review outline. All the topics are good, the same as before. Just any, all the dates on it, just ignore all the dates. So that's going to be the, kind of be your key focal point as you study is this review outline. From the review outline, you're going to look for quizzes, written homework, web work, video stuff, from the you know, class videos to help you uh, study, relearn, brush up on all these things on the review outline. So I have a set of quizzes, a lot of overlap with the quizzes we took, <clears throat> but all important stuff. There's actually a couple quizzes here. We didn't do a quiz on implicit. We didn't do a quiz on related rates and inferring from rate. We didn't do a quiz on optimization. So dig into these qu quizzes. I recommend work on the blank versions uh, and do as much as you can before looking at the solutions. If you're, if you're working on something with the solutions, it's not effective studying. Work on it like it was an exam. And do, do your best. Work together. Hold off on looking at those solutions until you can't you can't resist anymore, okay? <clears throat> but definitely, all the, all the written homework and web work, and of course the, the videos, things we've emphasized in lecture, is all pertinent for the exam. So find, that, find those practice problems um, that pertain to the review outline, and uh, that, those are all good study resources. Questions about exam three? Okay, so and then in addition, there is a, I tried to make it as short as we can, but we do, we do have to have homework for Thursday also. So homework for Thursday, first and foremost, study for exam three, but then there's a worksheet and then a, a web work. And th this isn't, th this is a lighter assignment. It's not really short, but it's definitely shorter, okay? And so that's why you want to focus your studying on, focus your time for studying for exam three, but we do need to, do some of this stuff to make sure we're on track for getting ready for the final exam. So there is a medium, short to medium length homework assignment for Thursday as well, consisting of this worksheet and WebWork 6. Okay, questions on any of that stuff? Okay, let's do, I want to do one from the WebWork. I want to do the kite problem from the WebWork. Is that number four or something? Say? Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, here we go. <clears throat> All right, so we want to really, what, really understand the situation. Start off by making a picture. And remember, our focus is going to be on the quantities involved. So a kite that's 50 feet above the ground moves horizontally. So let's get a sketch going here. Okay, so there's a, we've got a, a kite that's 50 feet above the ground. And it's moving horizontally at a speed of 8 feet per second. At what rate is the angle between the string and the horizontal decreasing when 100 feet of string has been let out? Okay, so we imagine that we're over here. We're flying this kite. Okay, and so it's moving 8 feet per second, and so there's an angle between the ground and the string. <clears throat> so what we want to do is, uh, we've kind of got the situation now, right? So the string's being let out, the, and the, the kite is moving directly horizontally, maintaining that 50 feet above the ground. So as that happens, then that, that angle will decrease, right? That angle measure will decrease. So what do we say? We say that the, we want, we're after the, all the rates in this problem. So what are all the rates in this problem? Because our ultimate goal is to get an equation that relates the rates. That's why this is called related rate problems, related rates. So we want an equation that relates all the pertinent rates. So we want to start by listing the rates. So what are the rates, known or unknown, that are involved in the problem? First rate is... So we read this, speed of 8 feet per second. There's a rate right there. The horizontal speed of the kite. So we'll just, for now, we'll just write 8 feet per second. And then it says at what rate is the angle between, and the, string, between the string and the horizontal decreasing? Well, there's a rate. So the angle measure rate. So these are the rates. We've got this rate of 8 feet per second and this angle measure rate. So let's talk about uh, quantities now, important quantities and assigned variables, right? That was number two. Now the most important quantities here are going to be the quantities for which we are, the rates we're focused on, right? So what are the associated quantities to the rates we're focused on? Now, whenever you have a speed, a speed is always a rate of change of what kind of quantity? A speed is a rate of change of what kind of quantity? Distance, right? So it's a, it's a, a speed, like 8 feet per second, is a rate of change of some distance quantity. So, what, so we imagine that the kite is you know, moving at 8 feet per second, but really there's some distance. There's some, there's some distance that's changing at a rate of 8 feet per second. So what distance is changing at 8 feet per second. So you can't just think of the kite as a point moving at 8 feet per second. There's got to be a quantity associated with it. So that has to be a distance that's changing at 8 feet per second. So what distance is that? Okay, well that's going to be the horizontal distance from the person to the kite. So we'll call that, what do we want to call that? X. It's a horizontal distance. So this 8 feet per second is really the rate of change of x more than just you know thinking of the kite as a point and how fast the, the kite is traveling we need it, it needs to be a rate of change of some quantity 
and that's that distance x, okay? <clears throat> so then this 8 feet per second, so x is horizontal distance to the kite from the person. So then what would the 8 feet per second, how would we label that 8 feet per second? Using now using x, what would eight feet per second be? That would be dx dt. That would be the rate of change of the distance x with respect to time. Okay. So then, then the other quantity we want is the associated quantity with this angle measure rate. Well, what quantity is that? What quantity is associated with the rate of change of angle measure? Angle measure. Angle measure, okay? So this is going to be angle measure. I'll say shown, okay? Let's save some writing, okay? <clears throat> so we get the rate of change of x, and so then this is going to be, that's this angle measure rate, that's our unknown, d theta dt. So we're identifying the rates, and then we identify the associated quantities. What, what, for the rate of change of 8 feet per second, what quantity is changing in 8 feet per second? Well, that's x. For the rate of change of angle measure with respect to time, what quantity is changing? Angle measure, okay? So, so to get the equation that relates the rates, we need the equation that relates those associated quantities. That's why we're, we're focusing on the rates and then getting those associated quantities because we need now an equation that ties together x and theta, and that will be the source of our related rates equation. So what ties together x and theta? So the easiest, is because this 50 is constant, we could use that's the what opposite side, and x is the adjacent. So the easiest way to set this up is tangent theta equals 50 over x. <clears throat> so now we've got the equation that relates the quantities for which we want to relate the rates. Okay, so how are we going to do this? So now we're going to do get the, we need to get what? We need to get uh, the equation that relates d theta dt and dx dt. Okay, so I want to, I want to change this around first. I want to make this x equals 50 cotangent. Can I do that? So what? So I multiply both sides by x, divided both sides by tangent. One over tangent is cotangent. I didn't have to do that, but I'm just um, thinking about taking the derivative, and I'm seeing that might make my life a little bit easier. Okay. So now I'm ready to go. So differentiating both sides with respect to t, I simply get dx dt on the left, and now we get 50 times. Remember what our derivative of cotangent is. Good practice from the mastery. Negative cosecant squared. No, but by the chain rule, then we need d theta dt. Okay, any questions so far? So we've, we've got kind of, this is kind of the whole... This was our goal, and it's how we can solve this problem because it relates the rate of the rate we know, dx dt, to the rate we want to know, d theta dt. So uh, if we're trying to find d theta dt, then we need uh, theta or co cosecant theta, and we need dx dt. Okay, so rather than solve for theta and plug it into cosecant, we can use the triangle just to figure out what cosecant is. Okay, so this is the same as negative 50 over, let's just do sine, negative 50 over sine squared, theta, d theta dt. 
So rather than solving for theta and plugging it back into sine, we can just, we can just plug sine theta into this. Use the triangle and figure out what sine theta is. What is sine theta? Sine theta equals, at this particular moment, there's 150 feet let out. So sine theta equals opposite over hypotenuse, 50 over 150, or one third. A lot easier than solving for theta. Solve for sine theta, use the triangle. It's, it's 50 over 150, or one third. So now I can, I can just plug one third squared here into the denominator. That's going to be a lot easier than back calculating theta and plugging it in. So I'm just going to do negative 50 over 1 third squared. And that's going to be equal to dx dt, which is our 8. And I, I'm home free. I'm going to find d theta dt. So I'll go up here in blue. So we got dx dt 8 equals negative 50 over 1 third squared d theta dt. Did you follow that? I'll, I'll, take, I'll pause for a moment. Follow everything I'm doing. Got the related rates equation. I changed uh, cosecant squared to 1 over sine squared. And then rather than solving for theta and plugging that in, I just can get sine theta. Sine theta is simply opposite over hypotenuse. So that's our the one that's this one third squared. So now I'm ready to solve for d theta dt, which is is one ninth. So eight ninths divided by negative fifty. Ask me. Eight ninths. It's gonna be one ninth times eight all over negative fifty. All right, does it make sense that d theta dt is negative? Does it make sense that d theta dt is negative and why? What would it, what does it mean for a rate to be negative? Yeah, we, we hammered that, right? We said that was, that was the whole thing in terms of coordinating a, a function and its derivative. That was one of the main principles we said. If a rate of change is negative, the actual quantity is decreasing. Is theta decreasing as the kite flies to the right there? Yeah, it's, 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 the string is, is coming down closer to the ground, decreasing the measure of that angle. Questions? Let's put it in and see how we did. Uh, okay, so yeah, so if it's asking for decreasing, then positive. So so our answer is so the negative is correct, but if it's asking how fast it's decreasing, then that then we're gonna make that positive. No need to cry, John. All right. Just want to get on that first try, right? Okay. Any questions on what I did? Remember, this is the thing I put a box around. That's what we're after. We're after the, the, the equation that relates the rates that they're talking about. Where does that come from? That comes from the equation that relates the quantities associated with those rates. So that's why we do the setup. We focus on the rates first. Can we figure out the quantities that are changing at that rate, right? I mean, that, from, from step one to step two is the easiest step, as long as you remember what the step is. It's just, what's changing at the rate? So if it's dx dt, then x is changing with respect to t. If it's d theta dt, what's changing? Theta is changing with respect to t. So that's the equation we want, the one of x and theta. When we take the derivative, then we get the equation of, that relates dx dt and d theta dt. Last chance before we go on. OK. <clears throat> so we're going to 
wrap things up here in the course. Which one am I going? This one, this one. So we're going to tie lots of things up today, right? So this is super important day. It's kind of we're coming to the pinnacle here. Okay? So remember that early on in the course, the first half of the course, we looked at this. You know how fast something is changing, and you want to know how much of it you have. That we spent the first two months on this endeavor. And now in the second half of the course, we've been looking at the opposite. We know how much of something we have, and we want to know how fast it's changing. We've been looking at all different aspects of that, optimization, related rates. <coughs> but going back to the first half of the course. <coughs> so we, we knew how fast something was changing, and that was uh, this, this red curve on the right is, this, is, a, is a, an example of a rate of change curve, telling you how fast something is changing at every moment. In this case, it is the rate of change of elevation as a function from at distance from, can't be the coast, so. I'll just say from landmark. Okay, and then over here is, is uh, elevation, uh, the elevation above sea level uh, from, the, from the landmark, okay, starting from the landmark. So this, this is elevation above sea level in feet, okay, and distance from, distance from the landmark. So, can we remember this? Using the exact rate of change of elevation R, can we write a function f that gives the exact accumulation of elevation starting, so, sorry, border, not a landmark, a border, get this all straight here. Okay, sorry. So, Using, exact, using the exact rate of change function r, can you write a function f that gives the exact accumulation of elevation starting from a miles to x miles from the border? Who remembers what we did back midway through the course? Given a rate of, cha rate of change function, can you write a function f that gives the exact accumulation of elevation starting a miles from the border to x miles from the border? So for instance, any, so any value a, so let's say right here, Starting from a miles from the border, can you write a function that will give accumulation of elevation from a to x? Everyone try. Go for it. Everyone try to do that. Okay, this is a different function. This is, this is elevation. Okay, so we want accumulation of elevation starting a miles from the border. So accumulation starting a miles from the border. Anyone think they got that? Hopefully a lot of you. Okay, one, two. How many people think they got it? Okay, Trevor, tell me what you did. Okay. Almost perfect. Yeah. What what was what was wrong with what he said? Yeah. Yeah, you gotta choose a remember you choose a different variable on the inside. Because X is what we're gonna remember that? Yeah. Okay. But yeah, so but you got it. Essentially you got it. We need a different variable inside. So this is that accumulation function. Starting a miles from the border, it's going to be the accumulation of elevation according to the rate 
to x miles from the border. Okay, and so let's just review the meaning meanings in this expression, right? So what does the integral sign mean? What's the integral mean? Oh, okay. So before we do that, so um, th what is this? This function is represented in an open form. An open form means it's reflecting a process. It's reflecting a process of of getting a value of the dependent variable. We need a we, need, we think through a process. Suppose we plug, we wanted f of 4, all right? If we wanted f of 4, there would be a process that this is reflecting to generate that value. It's not, you can't just plug 4 in and crank out something simple and get the answer. There's a process that, that will give you f of 4, okay? So that process is what? What does the integral mean? The integral means a sum, right? What are we summing up? What are we summing up in this? Sure. Okay. But what what exactly is getting added up? What is exactly is getting added up? What are we? Fill it. Infinitely small moments. Okay, infinitely small rates. Okay. What we're adding up is this whole product, R of T, D, T. What does R of T, D, T represent? That's what we're adding up, a bunch of little R of T times D, T's. Okay. Okay, yeah, so we're adding up little bits of accumulation. Little bits of accumulation. Each bit is our, our old familiar m dx, right? The change in y is m times the change in x. So each little bit of accumulation is calculated by the rate times the little change. And we're going to sum all those up, and that's going to give us what the total amount of accumulation starting at a and ending at x. All right, it's really important. Really important. So each bit is MDX, and we're summing up a gazillion little bits to get the total amount of accumulation from A to X. <clears throat> okay, so now suppose E is the elevation. So this is the elevation from the border, elevation. So it's 300 at the border and going up from there according to the rate. How else can f be written in terms of e? So now I want to write, using the function e, I want to write the same, the same amount of accumulation starting at a and ending at x, but I want to use the function e to do it. All right, think about that and try to do that. So how can I use e, the function e, to write something that's equivalent to this integral? So we want to make sure we have a really, if, if we have a really good meaning for this, then that's an easy question. So once again, what is the overall meaning of this integral? What's the overall meaning of this integral? What does that integral calculate in this context? Yeah. What, tell me what accumulation. What's that? What's that? Okay, but in this in this context. So be more specific. You're right. That's true. 
what amount of accumulation is it? Okay, it's so, but it's not from the border. It's not from the border. Somebody new. Yes, sir. Okay. Changes in what? Okay, so when we sum up all the little changes in elevation from A to X, what do we get? What do we get when we do that? You sum up all the little changes in elevation starting at A miles and ending at X miles. What do you get? What amount? But the amount of accumulation of what? Elevation, right? If we sum up all the little amounts of accumulation from A to X, we get a total amount of change or accumulation, right? Total amount of change or accumulation in elevation. So how can we use E to express that? He's suggesting E of X minus E of A. Does that get the same change in elevation that this does? Yeah, that's it. That's it. Because this is an elevation, so E of X is some value here, this is E of X. And then E of A is the Y value on this for this value of X. So the total change in elevation is E of X minus E of A, final minus initial. And that's the same as summing up all the little bits of accumulation between those two points. And that's what the integral says. So the accumulation of small changes in elevation from A to X miles from the border is the same as the total change in elevation from A to X miles from the border. This should make sense, and it's super important. It's really important, OK? On the left, the, it's reflecting the process of summing up all the little bits of changes in elevation. That's what the integral reflects. On the right, it's just saying, okay, let's just take a final value of elevation minus initial value. That's also going to calculate that total change in elevation, right? Should make perfect sense. Anybody have a question? Okay, so the, as, in the general sense, this is what we just did. We said if we take the integral from a to x of some rate function, dt, that equals that function at x minus the function at a. So the accumulation of small changes of a quantity from a to x is equivalent to the total change in that quantity from a to x. So where r of f is the rate of change of the quantity function f. So now this is more, so now we're out just saying it generically for any, any situation, not, not necessarily the elevation problem. Okay, so let's look at this. So here is a quantity, maybe it's an accumulation function, quantity function. What's the rate of change of f? What's the rate of change of f? Easy. 6x minus 1, right? 6x minus 1. So now here is an accumulation expression expressed as in open form as an integral. So what are we saying? We're saying that this is the total, this is the, uh, the sum of many little bits of change that occur at this rate, right? The sum of lots of little bits of change occurring from 4 to x, where this is the rate of change. So how can we rewrite it? How can we rewrite that 
as a total amount of change. Anybody see it? This is R sub F, right, of T. And what does this represent? It rep this whole thing represents the total amount of change as a sum of many little bits of change of the quantity F starting at 4 and ending at X. So what does this equal? He says f of x minus f of 4. What do you say? All right. We, we, yeah, we, yes, you're right. Yeah. f of x minus f of 4. Is that right? Yeah. Remember, so the left side is the total amount of change expressed as the sum of little bits of change using the rate. The right, then, would just be the total amount of change using the quantity, just the final value minus the initial value. Okay, but he points out that we know what f of x is. What is f of x? 3x squared minus x. So f of 4 is 3 times 4 squared minus 4. So what did we just find that we couldn't before? So before, at halfway through the course, we had these open form accumulation functions. But we never had a closed form before. We never had something where we could just plug in 7 and crank out an answer. We always had to think about it as that process and use technology to get the answer for us. But now this is the same as looking at it as the total change of the quantity function. So now we, we just were able to find a closed form representation of that integral that we, we couldn't, we weren't able to do that before. We just, we just had to stop here. If we had this, this accumulation function, that was all we had. But what is making this possible? What makes this possible is the fact that we, we have all the mastery rules. The fact that we knew that 6x minus 1 was the rate for 3x squared minus x also told us that if we have an open form accumulation function with that rate, it tells us that the quantity function is 3x squared minus x. We couldn't, we couldn't know that before we learned all the mastery rules. So now we have, through the mastery rules, we have this ticket to getting these open form representations of, of accumulation in closed form. We weren't able to do that before. So when we got halfway through the course, we just, we got these integral expressions and we stopped and we said we need technology to do it. But now with the, with the mastery rules, we know that 6t minus 1, well, we know that's the rate function for what? 3x squared minus x. 6x minus 1 is the rate function for 3x squared minus x. So we can use the quantity function 3x squared minus x and just plug in x and plug in 4 and get the total change. Let's try another one. Okay, so here f of x is 4 thirds pi r cubed. So what's the rate function for 4 thirds pi r cubed? 4 pi r squared. So now knowing that, if we came to an, an open form accumulation function like this, so suppose we have 10, the integral from 10 to x of 4 pi t squared dt. And we see 4 pi t squared is a rate of change. Well, we know what the quantity function is that has that rate of change. So rather than think of it as summing up a lots of little bits of change, we can use the quantity function and get the total change using the quantity function. So what is the quantity function that has a rate of 4 pi t squared? What is the quantity function that has a rate of 4 pi t squared? Right here. Right here. The quantity function that has a rate of 4 pi t squared. 
Yes, sir. Gunner, what do you think? What's the quantity function that has the rate of change for pi t squared? We know this is a rate function, right? So if we had the quantity function for this rate, we could just get the total change by evaluating the quantity at x, and at 10, it's subtracting. So what's the quantity function that has that rate, 4 pi t squared? Yeah. f of x, right? It's 4 thirds pi r cubed. Why? Because we just found it. We just found that 4 pi r squared was the rate of change for 4 thirds pi r cubed. Does it make sense? So this is the same as f of x minus f of 10. For this f, right? There's a new problem now, new f. What is f of x? 4 thirds pi x cubed, f of 10, 4 thirds pi times 10 cubed. Okay, clear as mud? Okay. Does it make sense? So, one more time. Because, because, so for this rate function, because we know the quantity function from which it came by the mastery rules, now whenever we have an open form accumulation function at that rate, we could also represent that just using the quantity function that has that rate. Taking, evaluating at the, the final value, evaluating at the initial value, and subtracting to get the total change. So just remember back to the elevation problem, right? The accumulation of little bits of elevation according to this rate was just the same as the final evaluation, uh, elevation minus the initial elevation. Same thing. Okay, so let's try another example here. Oh, you're kidding me. Hold on. Okay, so here's a rate function. 1 over 1 plus x squared is my rate function, okay? I want to represent that accumu accumulation function starting at x equals 1 in open form. So the accumulation function that changes at this rate, I want to represent an accumulation function that changes at this rate starting at x equals 1 in open form. Everyone should be able to do this. Write it down. Got a rate function, we want to write the accumulation function that accumulates at this rate starting at x equals 1. Michael, did you get it? Tell me. You didn't get it. Oh, okay. Jason, did you get it? Okay. Not something to be extremely happy about. Yes. No, no, an open form. Open form. The overachiever. Good job. But open form. Open form. One open form of the accumulation function. Did you get it? How do we, do, you guys? How do we do an open form given the rate function? An open form of the accumulation function given the rate function. Please know this integral of. Right. Integral from 1 to x of the rate function dt. Open form of the accumulation function, right? The sum of lots of little bits of change, where the, each little bit is rate times change in x. Rate times change in x. Okay, now. 
Can you write that same expression in closed form? Can you write that same expression in closed form? Who's paying attention? Can we do it? Write that expression now in closed form. Which we couldn't do before today, but now we have the tools to do it. R, right? This is rate of change. Which one? The one at the top is the rate of change function. So it's like R of X. How many people think they have it? Some. What do we need to write it in closed form? We need the function, the quantity function, who has this as its rate function. That's your hint. We need the quantity function that has this as its rate of change function. Then we can write a closed form representation of this. Keep going. Keep thinking about it. Is anybody getting it? Yeah. Oh, someone there? Okay. Then you're asking them what F is? Uh, yeah, some of them already have what F is. So I didn't know it's kind of unclear to them. I'm sure whether you want the function notation or you want them to go ahead and put it in the room. I want them to figure out what F is. Okay. Okay, now the question is what is F? So in this case, different than the previous examples, we didn't start by taking a, taking a derivative to get the rate of change. I'm just giving you the rate of change. Now I'm asking you, what function f would that be? That would have 1 over 1 plus x squared as its rate function. Because this really still isn't a closed form. This isn't a closed form until we know what f is. So this really isn't closed form yet. Because you can't plug something in and crank out a number unless you know what f is. So this isn't closed form yet. Closed form means we know what f is. And what is f? It's the function whose rate of change is 1 over 1 plus x squared. Okay, so what quantity, so back to mastery test, what quantity function has a rate of change? 1 over 1 plus x squared. Lots of you know, Levi. Arctangent, right? Arctangent has a rate of change of 1 over 1 plus x squared. So arctangent is our f in this case. So what's the closed, what's the closed form representation of this function then? If arctangent is the function whose rate of change is 1 over 1 plus x squared, then what's the closed form of this function? <clears throat> yes, sir? You got it. So in, in uh, graphing calculator, it's a tan. That's arc tan. a tan means arc tangent. Okay. So let's look at the graph of the accumulation, okay? Let's look at this accumulation. And so if, if we're correct, then these should both graph the exact same set of points. Both of these should have the exact same set of points. So let's look at the open form. We'll do red, okay? And then the closed form, I'm going to do blue, and it should look dark purple or something like that. Here we go, ready? Okay. So exact same set of points. Different representation though. Open form is the integral form. Closed form 
is the uh, using our tangent. Okay. Anybody have a question? Okay. I, I, I feel lots of you are thinking and working hard at it. It's good. Okay. So keep staying tuned in. Now, what do we see? What do we remember about this? How do you see the fact that we're starting at accumulating at 1 show up in the graph, right? So we're going to start accumulating at x equals 1. How does that show up then in the graph? We're going to begin accumulating at 1. Remember this? How does that show up in the graph? Yeah? No, no. so looking at the graph, how is it? Sh oh, so I could do that. I could do that. We know they're both the same. So how is the fact that we're starting accumulating at 1, how does that show up in the, the display graph? Yeah. Why is 0 at 1, right? Because at 1, there's 0 accumulation, right? There's 0 accumulation at, at x equals 1, where we start accumulating, and then we're going to accumulate from there, right? So at, at, that, at the a value, the total accumulation is zero because we haven't accumulated anything yet. But if I take away that x greater than one, what do you notice? So we're st before we thought about this as starting accumulating at x equals one, but what about x less than one? We have all these, this, this whole part of the curve over here for x less than one. So it's not really that we're starting accumulating at one. It's, it's it's like we've been accumulating all along. It's, we've been accumulating all along, and what happens at 1? What happens at 1? So it's like all this is a, accumulation, maybe starting from negative infinity or something. But then what happens at x equals 1? It's kind of like what we want to think about this is we get like a reset of the accumulation. We're going to get 0. A total accumulation at this a value and so rather than saying we're going to start accumulating there we want to think more about like this is like a reset why because we've are it's already been accumulating in fact starting from negative infinity it was accumulating and it's just by by writing the integral from 1 to x that forces us to get a reset like so if we start over at 1 from 0 even though we've been accumulating all along. Yeah? So the Q stands at x over 1, but x over 2 is still the end of the graph. OK, so if I, if I put 2 in here, what will we see? So the question is, how will it shift it? What will the shift be like? Okay, so here's starting from one. So how will it shift? How will it shift if, if I now get a reset at two? What will we do to the red graph to get a reset at two? Move it down one. Shift it to the right? Move it down one. If we sh if the, if it's the original graph shifted to the right, do they have the same rate function? No, they don't. But these two have the same rate function. You see that? These two functions have the same rate function. But it can't be shifted to the right. So what kind of shift would maintain the rate function but give a reset at 2? So what was that? Yeah, down, right? So if we move the whole thing straight down, then all the rate of change, the whole rate of change profile will be maintained, right? Rate of change is change in y over change in x. So by shifting it down, the rate profile is maintained, and we get that reset at 2. So that's what's going to happen for this one. It's not shifted, the red graph shifted right. It's the red graph shifted down. So now these have maintained the same rate of change for all values of x. But the blue one now has the reset at 2 instead of 1. OK. Does it make sense? 
Okay, let's try another one. Here you go. So here's the rate function. So it says, represent the accumulation function starting at x equals negative 2.5. Okay, in open form and in closed form. But now we're going to update this. Rather than representing the accumulation function starting at x equals 2.5, it's going to be the, the function with a reset at x equals negative 2.5. Because it very well could be accumulating before negative 2.5, but we want it to reset to 0, the amount of accumulation to reset to 0 at negative 2.5. Okay, so now it's up to you. You're going to write this in open form in two ways. Use function notation and use the function rule to write open form, and then write closed form. <coughs> okay, go. We'll walk around and, and help you out here. One more lap here. Show me what you got.
Since we've been running a Friday, Monday, Wednesday recitation, can I have permission to cancel Friday recitation but still be there and hold an optional final sure. review? Okay. And what was my other question? Um, you yeah, think that's that better? There's, better. Nothing, there's nothing to do on Friday. All this stuff we do this week. Yeah, but then only my Friday kids are going to get it. So it's better to make it optional for everyone. Oh, okay. So that the ones that really want to come can come. Instead of the Friday kids will get it and the Monday and Wednesday kids will not get it. Okay. I guess so. Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? Because yeah, sure. it's the last. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So here are the two open form ways that I kind of suggested uh, using function notation would just be the integral negative 2.5x RTVT. And then now, so the using the rule would be then what's the rule for RT? 4 thirds T, 1 third cosine T to 4 thirds TT. So if we want closed form, then what do we need? Closed form would be representing it as the total change in the quantity starting at negative 2.5 and ending at X. So to get that, what do we need? We need the function, what? Whose rate of change is this? The quantity function that has this as its rate. So if this is R of say G or something, then what is G? So, you, so it's about knowing your mastery rules really well. Like what, what would you do and get this from, from, a, from a, an amount function get this as its rate of change. Now some of you some of you got it. Did you get it? Tell me. Alright, so he, he's saying sine of x to the four thirds. Is he correct? But if you're not sure, how could you know if it's correct or not? Take the derivative, okay? This, this, is, this is the thing. Just, you know, um, nothing bad happened to you for writing that down, like, if you weren't sure. But you can now find out by taking the derivative. What is the derivative of sine of x to the 4 thirds? Cosine x to the 4 thirds times chain rule 4 thirds x to the is that the rate function we started with? Uh, got it. So now what's the closed form of this accumulation function? Somebody knew. What's the closed form of this particular accumulation function? Yes, ma'am. I think she's on to something. Right, it's going to be the, the initial value of the quantity, which will be sine evaluated at x, whatever it is, minus the final value. Final minus initial gives total change, right? Final value of the quantity would be that thing evaluated at x, minus initial value of the quantity would be uh, sine negative 2.5 to the 4 thirds. And what, if I did, were to graph these, first of all, we'd expect them all to be the same graph, but what else would we expect? What other detail would we expect in the graph of this accumulation function. What's that? What are you going to say? At negative two and a half, we should see zero. So these should all be the same, first of all. Oh. Let's just do those. Right? So I already had those below. But anyway, so when I graph it, they should all be the same. Maybe. And what else did we say? The other detail is that at negative 2.5, we want to we should have a reset, and we do. Reset at negative 2.5 of zero. Okay, so this is the accumulation function that has the rate that we started with, that cosine, complicated cosine function, and has a reset at negative 2.5. If we had a reset, if we started, if we integrated from negative 3 to x, put that in. 
So let's say we'll go from negative 3 to x. How will that change the graph? So the black one is the one that we worked on, and now the blue one has a reset at negative 3. It's an upshift so that the rate profile is maintained. For every x value, these two have the same rate that we started with, just a different reset, right? A reset at negative 3 instead of a reset at negative 2.5. Okay, so what we're, what we're really talking about here um, as to solve these is what, what's called antiderivative, right? We're given now the rate function. We're asking what function, what quantity function has that rate of change? So that's antiderivative, antiderivative. So being good at antiderivatives is simply a matter at, of being really good at derivatives. We're not going to learn a whole new set of rules. We're going to apply the same rules, but we have to, it's like a, higher order thinking, we have to think backwards. What function would have given me this rate function? Okay, so let's look at that. Okay, so here's a, an easy one. So write a closed form version of this accumulation expression, this open form expression. Write a closed form version of this. Compared to the last ones, this should be easy. Did you get it? The whole thing is x to the third? Okay. So it would be x to the third. So I'm going to write an open, for, closed form expression for this, for this integral. What's he say? Oh, I just didn't hear you. Sorry. Sorry. No, that's right. So you should have gotten this, right? What is the quantity function that has a rate three t squared, three x squared? X cubed. So we're, to get the total change, we're going to evaluate uh, x at x cubed and one at x cubed. Okay. What's the derivative of x cubed minus one? What's the derivative of x cubed minus 1? It better be 3x squared or else we did something wrong, right? So, so this antiderivative needs to have the rate 3x squared, and it does. Okay, next one. Ricardo, did you get it? Tell me. Which equals? What's the rate of change of x cubed plus 8? 3x squared. You want, want to do the time? Um, x squared 
And we'll just leave it that way. We'll, we'll play that out. We'll just leave it. And what's the derivative of that? What's the rate of change for that? Okay, so given an accumulation function, how many rate functions does it have? Given an accumulation or an amount function, how many rate of change functions does it have? In any given value of x, there's only one rate of change. So there's only one rate of change function given an accumulation or amount function. Given, an, uh, given a rate of change function, how many accumulation functions have that rate of change? More than one, right? Many. There's many accumulation functions that can all have the same rate. But there's only one rate function for a given amount or accumulation function. Okay. So this is the idea of, of antiderivative. Okay? If g is the derivative of f, if g is f's rate of change function, then f is called an antiderivative of g. Okay? So given a function f, its derivative is the rate of change function. Antiderivative of any antiderivative of a rate of change function is has that as its rate. Okay, so every accumulation function is an antiderivative of its rate function. Every accumulation function is an antiderivative of its rate function. But like we said, every rate of change function has more than one antiderivative. Okay, so now this next slide is like the culmination of what we've worked on all semester, okay? This pulls together everything we've done for the semester. Fundamental theorem of calculus. If capital F is any antiderivative of little f, then what does this open form expression equal? Okay, so if capital F is any antiderivative of f, what? Meaning that capital F has little f as its rate of change function, then what does this open form integral expression equal? Okay, you should all be thinking capital F of X minus capital F of A. <clears throat> okay, so then evaluating that function at a particular value of B. Okay. Evaluating that function at a particular value of b would simply mean the total accumulation from a to b, expressed two different ways, right? Expressed as the sum of little bits of change and expressed as the total change from starting at a and ending at b. So the first one is like the function version of the fundamental theorem. The second one is just uh, the a total amount, a particular amount version. Particular amount version, function version. And that's what we just, that's what we worked on all, uh, built up all day today. But the pieces of this took us all semester to, to, to attain. Okay, so you do have, make sure you, you do have a short-ish homework 